Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for protection as we were at camp and tra traveling there and traveling home, traveling through the storm. Just thank you for uh, just the peace that uh, prevailed amongst us, Lord. I thank you, God, for what was done at camp. Thank you for the conversions. Thank you for the lives that were changed. God, I pray that you'll take what was done there and use it for your honor and glory. But even now, Lord, we ask that you would be with us in the midst of this lesson. Um, God, I don't, I can't have confidence in myself in this lesson because I don't completely understand uh, everything that's going on in this lesson. So God, we ask that you would do what you've called the Holy Spirit to do, and that is to enlighten our eyes, open up our understanding, help us to understand how you work, God, and not how we think you work, but how you actually work. Give us your grace. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. John chapter 6, 37 through 40. Unbelievable confidence. Sister Stephanie, unbelievable confidence. So you can write it down because I did not do, as I keep telling you I'm going to do, unbelievable confidence. It was a great time at camp. God really moved. Heard a lot of testimonies. Heard a lot of young people talking about how what God was doing in their life. Heard a lot of young people. For the first time, some of them had never heard of critical race theory. Um, so that was enlightening for a lot of them. And then just knowing that you know, how to deal with it from a biblical viewpoint. I, I, I kept telling the preacher, I said, you know, because that, that, the theme was amongst the adults, well, what can we do? Every, every, serve, every time we had the class, someone would say, what can we do? And then we were walking around the campus, what can we do? And I told the preacher, I said, you know, you need to let people know that God didn't call us to be militants. We are not called to be militia. We don't go and start shooting these people down and doing all kind of crazy stuff to them. We have to do things according to the word of God. And so he did bring that out. And he did have a couple of people that told him about militias and things like that. And I'm like, oh my goodness. All righty. So, but anyway, um, it was a good time. God bless. The armor of God was great. I think Preacher's going to be showing a short video of the summary of all the different points in the um, sermons throughout the whole week. It's not just one. It sounds like one sermon. But what the guy actually did was took uh, parts of all the sermons and put them together and it was really great so God was really really working and I praise the Lord for what he did John chapter 6 verse 37 through 40 is where we're going to jump at I know we kind of left out some things from last the last week but I want to get into this and if we don't finish this for this week or next week I don't care uh, this is important and um, it has some doctrine in it that we don't normally think about. And I want us to start to think on John chapter 6, verse 37 through 40. And we'll see more of it next week and the week after that and the week after that. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which have sent me, that all that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but shall raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that seeth, which seeth the Son, everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Before we get started, there is a... Um, doctrine uh, called um, irresistible grace. And that doctrine, and I think I'm going to go through it again a little bit, I want to hit it right now. That doctrine says that God has ordained from the beginning of the world who will and who won't be saved. God has already ordained it. It has been ordained. Not that he doesn't want everybody to be saved, but God is a realist, just like we should be realists. Not everybody will be saved. God has given Jesus as our, our uh, sacrifice for sin, and yet God realizes that not everyone will take that sacrifice. Case in point, the Jews, as we saw, their goal was never to have Jesus as the Messiah that God prophesied in the Old Testament. Their goal was to have a political king and to be able to come out 
from underneath the rule of Rome and never go into captivity again. That was their goal. And like many people today who are in church, I'm not even going to, we'll talk about the loss in just a minute, but many people are sitting in church today lost, thinking they are saved, thinking they have the Savior, but they don't have the Messiah. They have the Jesus in their head. And they may have did that Romans road prayer, and they may have, when they were five or six or 10 or 12, prayed a little prayer. And they may have been baptized by their favorite preacher. They may have gone to all the conferences and all the camps and all those different things, and yet they are not saved. They know truth, but they're not saved. I was telling preacher, because it drives me crazy to see people say, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, I love the Lord, I want to walk with God, and yet never see the fruit of Jesus working out in their life. If we have two trees in our yard, one's a green apple tree, Granny Smith apple tree, <laughs> and one's a red. I'm not sure what it is. It looks like a Macintosh. The Granny Smith apple tree, the, the trunk is there, but there's no leaves on it, no branches on it. It is completely dead. It is still an apple tree. It looks like the same. It looks like the apple tree. You go, you look at it, go, oh, that looks like apple tree, the trunk of apple tree, but it's dead. The tree next to it is an apple tree also but it's bearing fruit. It has leaves. It had, and admittedly, preacher did cut down the green apple tree because it wasn't doing anything but dying more and more. And in this section of scripture, we are going to be looking at why there are Christians. First, we'll look at why the lost stays lost. There are some people, it doesn't matter what you say to them. It doesn't matter what you do to them. They will be lost. And we're going to look at why. We're going to also look at why there are people in church who say they are, good morning, who say they are saved, and yet you never see fruit of it. You never see any um, activity for the Lord. And then you're going to see why there are people who get saved and love the Lord and walk with God and want to serve the Lord. It is, it is all up to God. It is all up to God. And so the, so the Lord starts off, he just declared his identity to the Jews. We're in chapter 6, 37 through 40. He declares his identity to the Jews. He declares himself to be the bread of life in the verse 35. And then he says one of the saddest verses in the Bible. He says, ye have also seen me and believe not. Those are people that sit in church day in and day out, started off in, as, as babies in churches, think they are saved because they prayed a prayer, but yet never connected to the Savior. Listen, when Jesus saves you, you are forever changed. I was talking to Mrs. Grohl, and we were talking about one of the young ladies at their church, Heather, and Heather is on fire for God because Heather realizes the sins that God had brought her out of. She understands where she was. She realizes that she is a sinner at best, at worst, and a sinner saved by grace at best. And she was talking about how some of the young people, they get so frustrated with her because she's so excited about Jesus. And she said she had to explain to her young ladies that, listen, the reason she's so excited about Jesus is because she sees where Jesus brought her from. But her young ladies grew up in church. Grandparents is the, was the pastor and wife, pastor, and now the father is the pastor, the uncle is the pastor, the uncle is a, a preacher in his own right, and they've always been in church. And so they don't always see how wicked they really are. And because they don't always see how wicked they really are, they don't fully understand how, how, precious their salvation is. And because sometimes we don't see how wicked we are, it's really why we don't really accept Jesus as our Savior. We pray a prayer because we were in junior church. We pray a prayer because pastor told us to pray a prayer. We pray a prayer because our parents tell us to pray a prayer. But we, we don't come to the point where we realize how desperately we need a Savior because, you know, we're not that bad people. Yeah, this, that, that was the Jews' mentality. We're not that bad of people. I mean, come on. I don't do wicked stuff like other people. I'm a good person. 
That was the Jews, Jews mentality. I'm a good person. And so the Lord begins to tell them that it doesn't really matter because God is the one that calls you. And if you don't answer God's call, not your parents' call, not the junior church leader's call, not the pastor's call, but if you don't answer God's call, you are not saved. Don't have the mentality of many people that say, well, God wouldn't send anybody to hell. God would never send. I mean, I've been in church all my life. I got my 40-year Sunday school pen. Remember the Lord said, God said, uh, Jesus said, many of you are going to stand in heaven. And you're going to say, Lord, I did this in your name, and I did that in your name. And God's going to say, I never knew you because you're not answering the Lord's call. You're answering the church's call. You're answering the family's call. You're answering the Sunday school teacher's call. We must answer God's call according to salvation. Now, we have Calvinism, and I, I don't understand all this, so I'm not an authority. And if you got something that will help us understand this, bring it out, because that is what Sunday school is for. Sunday school is not for me to sit stand up here and pontificate. It is for us to get to know the word of God. Calvinism says that God has elected some. And you'll see in the word of God that that's exactly what God says. But they say God has elected some. So some people will be saved and some people will be lost. Okay, that's just common sense. Right. The Bible says that narrow is the way to life and broad is the way to death. OK, but they go further and say that because God has elected some to be saved, we don't need to do anything about it. We need to just sit and enjoy life. And and and, you know, those people that God has called, they will come to God. And, and, and those people that God didn't call, they won't come to God won't come to God. They, but when you take them to Matthew 28, where it tells you to go into all, to all the world and preach the gospel and, and to teach, and they, they don't know what to do with that. They have no idea what that means because it is God's responsibility to bring someone to Christ. But we see here that Jesus is actually agreeing with them. He says, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. This is confidence for the sinner. Number one, we have confidence for the sinner. All means every sinner who will ever be saved. Not every sinner, but every sinner who, ever, who will ever be saved. He says, all that the Lord gives me, they'll come. If God calls you, if he puts it in your heart, you will come. This, this may make your heart shake because you're looking at family members and wondering, God, will you ever bring them to you, Lord? Lord, are they the ones that you've called to them? This may make your heart shake when you look around and see lost people all over the world. Preacher has a letter he's going to be reading. People all over the world that you wonder, God, are, are they the one? Are they the one? God, are they the one? And you wonder. But it's not for us to wonder. It is for us to tell. It is our job to get the gospel out. It is our God, job to do it. I'm going to jump ahead just really quick. Someone asked, I think it was D.L. Moody. He says, what do you do about this election situation? If God has elected everybody to be saved, why are you so busy about sharing the gospel? And D.L. Moody said, well, you know what? If God has elected everybody to be saved, and, and the only way I'm going to know is that there's a yellow stripe down that person's back, then it's my job to lift up every shirt till I find that person with the yellow and give them the gospel. It's our job to get the gospel out. It's God's job to save. It is God's job to save. We're going to talk about our responsibility also. But if you are saved, you are saved because of God. If you have Jesus in your heart, you are saved because it is God's gift to uh, of eternal life you cannot get it any other way you can't get it from coming to church you can't get it by just saying a little prayer you must commit your life to the lord jesus christ because god has called stop and think for a minute what is it about us that would make us want to come to god because stop and think but when you when, when when god calls you he's telling you one thing you're a wicked sinner and you need to change your ways how many of us like to change Unless sin makes us terribly uncomfortable, we can live with sin. My uncle, uh, my uncle Robert Lee, was an alcoholic to the max. He was that stumble down drunk alcoholic. He spent all of, all of life that I knew him drunk. 
He was as drunk as drunk could be. That's what he did. He didn't want to change. They put him in the hospital. They'll dry him out. As long as he was in the hospital, he was dry. When he came out of the hospital, he didn't say, man, I'm glad I'm out of that, that uh, condition of uh, drunk. He went to go find his friends and get drunk again. He, he died in a nursing home before his mother, his mother and my grandmother lived a long time. He died in her nursing home before his mother. And one of the biggest reasons he died was because his liver couldn't handle normal functioning things. It been, it had, he had gotten cirrhosis and he died because of his lifestyle. None of us will give up our sins unless the Holy Spirit convicts us of it. You know how I know? Because we're still doing certain sins. Because we still fall back into certain sins. Because some sins we've never gotten victory over, not because we can't, but because we don't want it. Our salvation is a gift of God. God gives us to Jesus. The Father giveth me. He is the one behind our salvation. Nothing. And sometimes I think we forget it. That there is nothing, nothing in us that God looked down and said, you are the best. You are the greatest. I got to have you on my team. Nothing. Remember, at the very best, we are sinners. At our very worst, we are enemies of God. And I think if we can get a hold of that and if it will humble us, if we will allow that thought to humble us before a holy and righteous God, if you are truly saved, you will see the fruit of God start working in your life. One of the biggest issues we have is that we don't think we're as wicked as we really are. We don't think we're as bad. Of course God will save me. I mean, if there was a true election, of course I would be one. I mean, look at me. And that's where our thoughts are. But God says, no, 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 no. I saved you because I wanted to. Somebody, and I didn't write it down. I wish I had. But God was telling the uh, Israelites, I think it's in Deuteronomy, he says, look, I didn't choose you because you were the greatest, the greatest nation. In fact, I chose you because you were the smallest nation. I didn't choose you because you had anything going for you. In fact, you had nothing going for you. As a matter of fact, you had so much not going for you that I stuck you into slavery for 400 years. For 400 years, you were going into slavery. And then all through their history, you'll see that even though they were God's elect, even though they were God's chosen, they constantly fell into sin and constantly had to be put in bondage. And you know that God never, ever, ever gave them up completely. Even now, as we're being grafted in, the Jews are still God's chosen people. And we need to realize that there is nothing in us. God gave us to Jesus Christ. We didn't decide to follow Jesus on our own. If you hadn't heard the gospel, you'd still be walking around in your sin. If you hadn't been listening, and in all honesty, we've seen it many times, people sit in church and hear the gospel and still walk around in their sin. God gave us to Jesus. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. I love Ephesians. I love, love, love Ephesians because Ephesians always, always reminds me of who I am in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 4. We're going to see this verse again. It says, according as he have chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And if you look at verse 5, it says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. You are saved because God wants you to be saved. That is the only reason we are saved. There is nothing in and of ourselves that causes us to be saved. And we need to get that, and I'm going to keep hitting it and hitting it and hitting it because we tend to think of ourselves way too highly. And we don't humble ourselves before a mighty God. It is God, the Holy Spirit, that draws you and me to Jesus Christ. It is the Holy Spirit of God. John 6, says, and we'll see later, No man can come unto me except the Father, which have sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 65 in the same chapter, and he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it was given unto him of my Father. We don't know how wicked we are. We don't know that we need a Savior until the Holy Spirit tells us, until God brings us. Now, for me, when I first started going through this, and, I, and that was this morning because my whole lesson got changed as I was going through my old lesson. I was like, oh, I don't want to know this. For me, when I first read that, I think, wait a minute. 
So that, that does sound like God is showing favoritism. But God just said he was no um, respecter of persons in Romans. He said there's a difference between the Jew and the Greek in Romans 10. So how do we, how do we make this work? How do we say, well, God, look, you just said no man can come to you unless you've drawn him. God also said that, that you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come into eternal life. How do we reconcile this together? How do we make this work together? How does it fit? God's very clear on the matter of salvation. We don't get saved unless he calls us. No one, no one in the world will simply choose to follow Jesus. No one. That is not our state. Our lost state is in darkness. Our lost state is in sin. Okay. Uh, Cain. Cain says, you know what? I know what's right. But, you know, I'm going to give God my very best. And he should accept that. Remember? And God doesn't accept it. Cain gets mad. And before Cain can commit a sin, God comes to him and says, wait a minute. You know what, to, what was expected. You don't, have to, you don't have to do this sin. I have a sacrifice for you at the door. I have it so that you can do exactly what I want you to do. You don't have to sin. That was the Holy Spirit of God coming to Cain and trying to keep him from going off into sin more than he was and to turn to the Savior. And Cain rejected. Human responsibility. God says, I know who's going to be saved. But it is your responsibility to accept that call. It is your responsibility to decide that you're going to take that sacrifice offered at the door. If God does not call you, you will not come. If God does not save you, you will not be saved. That is why Jesus had to die on the cross. Because even if we were to have died on the cross, even if we had gone through those hours of torture and pain, it would not have been enough to, sacri to uh, satisfy for Jesus to be the propitiation for God's wrath. We would still be in our sin. But it is of God. You cannot respond to Jesus unless Jesus first comes to you as a sinner. Ephesians 2. Three and four. Let's look at Ephesians chapter two, one through three. We'll just look at all of that because it's going to be like it or not. We are dead in our trespasses and dead people can't do anything but be dead. All right. I always get a kick out of my, my brother in law. He tells the stories of how even though people have been embalmed, even though they're embalmed, their bodies still make noises. <laughs> Like, oh my goodness. <laughs> and, he, and he used to do makeup and hair for a nurse for a funeral home. I'm like, I would never, I don't, I don't care. I would never because the first time it makes a noise, I'm out. I'm, and I'm not coming back. I'm just telling you. It's just, no. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3 says, And you have he quickened, which were dead in trespasses and sin. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all have our conversations in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Nothing, nothing in us would have caused us to come to God. We were dead. Dead people don't respond. And yet we have a power, the Holy Spirit of God, that draws us. The Bible says he's quickened us. He's brought us back to life so that we don't have to be dead in our trespasses and sin. All right. You cannot come to God unless you are brought back to life. The Bible tells us in 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. It, it's not the other way around. He loved us first. And then we learn to love him. That's the only way it happens in, in and of ourselves. You know how I know it's hard for us to love God? Because the Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? Is it hard to keep the commandments of God? Yes, yes it is. Because we love ourselves more. And the more we crucify ourselves daily, the more we love God, the more we fall in love with God, where God just looks at us and says, I love you. I, I know what you are. I know your worth. I know everything you have done, everything you will do, and yet I have chosen to love you. We never do that. We love God when he's doing what we want. If God doesn't do what I want, love becomes a burden. 
When we want something that God says no to, love becomes a hindrance. We need to keep this in mind. This is important. I was telling preacher, this, is, this section of scripture is one of the most important scriptures that we need to get into our hearts because it will remind us why we must stay humble. It will remind us why it's hard to resist the devil. It reminds us of how much we need the Lord Jesus Christ. It reminds us that we are nothing without God. And for a lot of people to say you are nothing without God irks. It kind of, you know, uh -uh. You know, it kind of makes you feel kind of mad because you know you are something in your own world. But in God's eyes, we're nothing without him. And then he says, all shall come to me. The, word, the work that God began in eternity past will be carried out fully in time. If God has called you, he will redeem you. If God has redeemed you, you have eternal life. He says, all shall come. All of them shall come to him. He came, I came to the Lord because he came to me first. God talked to me and I accepted. The Holy Spirit showed me that I needed a savior and I accepted. You know what? Listen, there are people who will never hear the Romans road. There are people who will never get a knock on their door by Heritage Baptist Church or any other Baptist Church or any other religion out there. There are people who will accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, commit their lives to Christ without any of us ever saying a word to them. Why? Because it is the Holy Spirit of God that brings us to salvation, that causes us to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that we can't that we're not supposed to share. It just means that God is the one doing the work. God is the one doing the work. The only work we do is to work out our salvation, to work, to walk worthy of the vocation where which we are called. That's all we do. Other than, other than that, we can't do it. We are talking about election, divine election, and human responsibility. Divine election. God foresaw it in the, in the, uh, before the foundation of the world as we saw and what we are supposed to do about it. There is no choice. Listen, if God has you on his radar, if God means for you to walk with him, to serve him, to love him, you will do it. You will do it and you will do it until he calls you home. You need to know that you're saved. You need to know that it's the voice of God calling you to salvation and not a human voice. We talked to this one man long time ago, preacher and I were out soul winning in Waukegan, and preacher was asking him if you're 100% sure you're going to go to heaven. He said, yes, I know I'm going to heaven. And preacher said, well, how do you know? He says, my mama told me I was going to heaven and my mama don't lie. <laughs> and we, we both, after we got in the car, just broke up laughing because he did not want to hear the gospel because his mama had already told him he was going to be saved. He's going to be in for the shock of his life, and so is his mama because your mama can't tell you you're saved. Your junior church leader can't tell you you're saved, and, and, and nobody can tell you you're saved except the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the one that does the saving. You know if your prayer was real. You know if you truly committed yourself to the Lord. But you can't judge me, Mrs. McMiller. You can't judge me. The Bible says don't judge. No, that's not true. The Bible says judge righteous judgment. The Bible says that you judge a fruit by what it's doing. If my apple tree starts producing pears, I got a problem. My apple tree must not be an apple tree. It must be a different type of tree. If we as Christians people who have prayed a prayer, people who have accepted Christ in our life as our Lord and Savior, begin to live like the world on an all-the-time, continuous basis, have no desire for the things of God. Once the, the um, yoke of iron has been lifted from us, you know, from our parents making us do things, our preacher making us do things, because we're young and we have to comply. We have to comply because we're young. And then the moment that yoke of iron is taken off and we decide to go the way of the world, you need to check your salvation. You need to check your salvation. Once one young man said, I want to be the prodigal son. Are you stupid? Are you foolish? Do you know what Satan can do? Do you understand what Satan can do? We need to know that we are saved. We need to know that our salvation is real. Check yourselves. Mrs. McMillan, you're judging me. 
No, I'm not judging you. The word of God is judging you. And you're too fearful, praise the Lord, to look at God and say, God, how dare you judge me? So you look at the person that's the person you can see. God is serious. God is serious. He will call you to salvation. But if you find yourself not wanting the things of God, listen, I get tired of this backslidden stuff. This isn't in my notes. But I get tired of hearing about backsliding because I grew up hearing that all the time, that people backslid. I'm, I'm, back, I'm just backsliding right now. I'm sure you've all heard people say that. I'm just backsliding right now. I'm just backsliding right now. I'm just backsliding right now. Do you know what happened every time Israel backslid, backslid? They went into bondage. Every time they turned away from God, they went into bondage. Why? Because they had never really accepted the spiritual part of being chosen by God. All they saw was the physical. That's why they had a problem with Jesus. <laughs> That's why they wanted to put him up on the cross, because they weren't looking for the spiritual. That's why only Joshua and Caleb went into the promised land of that generation of people. Of that generation of people, only Joshua and Caleb went into the promised land. Everybody else died in the wilderness. God was showing us a type. That even though they, he had chosen them, he had called them for a reason, they had not accepted the call. And all through the book of Judges, you see a generation of people over and over again hearing about the call, knowing the call, but yet not accepting the call. And all through our generation today, we see the same thing. We see a bunch of people who grew up in churches, who know the word of God. They hear the call. For a while, they walk as if they're in the call, and then they reject the call over and over and over again. Because although the Lord is calling, they are not accepting. It looks like acceptance as long as somebody's on them. It looks like acceptance as long as somebody keeps the boundaries tight. But when God says to walk in liberty, you don't walk in liberty, you flee. And you go walk according to the world. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And this part that we all, we all just kind of read but don't think about. And that not of yourselves. You cannot save yourself. Your salvation cannot be based on anything you can do because you can't save yourself. It is a gift of God. Know that you know that you know that you're saved. Don't trust some little prayer that you did and yet don't see your life changing. Don't trust some little uh, person that came to you and gave you the gospel in, on a piece of paper and yet your life is not changing. The Bible does not say that. The Bible says that he is a new creature in Christ Jesus. God does not leave you the same. Oh, but Mrs. McMiller, you know, we got to grow in grace, and growth is slow. Growth is as slow as you want growth to be. Growth is as slow as you want it to be, because you know what makes us grow? The Word of God. First Peter tells us that. Desire, desire the sincere milk of the Word that ye may grow thereby. The more of your Bible you're in, the more you will grow. People that met preacher before we got saved and then met him after we got saved was, are amazed at his growth in the Lord because he's always in the word of God. He's always in the word of God. Are you growing? Are you in the word of God? It's the Holy Spirit calling you to the word of God. He doesn't just call you to salvation. And then he calls you to live a holy life. Are you living a holy life? So many young ladies that I talked to while we were at camp. And the situations and problems and things that we were discussing at camp with some of these young ladies. It is all because they're, they're not in the word of God. They're not saved or they're not in the word of God. God's word does not lie. Well, I don't understand why I can't get victory. Do you really want victory? Are you saved? Because salvation brings victory. That's what it does. That's what it does. It is our responsibility to accept the Savior. It is God's responsibility to call us to his own. He will always do his responsibility. It is our responsibility to accept the Savior. It is God's responsibility to show us how we can be changed. It is our responsibility to do the work of the changing. The Holy Spirit says this, 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 and this. And we say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Or we say, nope, not doing that. This is how it works. This is how it works. Because some people say, Calvinists say, you're elected, you don't have to do anything about it, God will find you. Then some people say, well, I know I'm elected, and I know God's got to find me, but i got to work really hard at it. No, you don't. 
You just have to accept it. You have to be willing to humble yourself and accept it. It is our responsibility. Romans 10, 9 through 13 says that thou shalt confess, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God have raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Not with your head, not with what you know. The Jews knew a lot, and yet they crucify the Lord of glory, as, it's so, as uh, Peter said in, in Acts. They knew a lot. And some of us sitting in this room, some of us is listening on this video, we know a lot, but we don't believe in our heart unto righteousness. We know a lot. We heard it all our lives. We hear it and we hear it. And we, we have so much gospel saturation in the world that it has become commonplace and it lacks the power of God because it's so commonplace. It's just like the Jews with the manna from heaven. You know, the manna comes down every night. They get it up every morning. On, on, on a Saturday night, on Friday night, it comes down heavier so they don't have to pick it up on Saturday on the days that they're supposed to, on the Sabbath day. After a while, what do they say? What is this? Man, I, I want some leeks. I want some onions. I want some bacon. No, he didn't say he wanted bacon because they know they couldn't eat bacon. Okay, no. <laughs> All right. They may have ate, eaten bacon before because y'all got to realize they didn't know anything about not eating bacon until after Egypt. I'm just saying. The, the, it was given after Egypt. So I'm glad I'm not a Jewish person. That was, that was just, anyway, back to here. So in other words, they knew in their, in their heads, but it wasn't in their hearts. And we need to confess in our hearts, our heart, our, the, the place where the place that makes us do things, our heart. It says, for the scripture said, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If anyone is going to be saved, it is because God has called them and they have chosen to obey the call. I love Preacher's title for his uh, radio, Answer the Call. Answer the Call. Answer the Call of God. If you've answered that call of salvation, answer the call of holiness. If you've answered the call of salvation, answer the, the call of walking worthy of that call. Decide that God is worth living for, not just I got Jesus. I go to church. I'm a good person. I can look, I can do some scriptures every now and then, but actually do something with what God has given to you. Don't have the attitude that a lot of believers has, as I said earlier. Oh, God won't let anybody go to hell. You're right. He won't let anybody go to hell, but he will let you. He will let you choose it. It will be your choice. Now, listen, some of us have been in church forever and we're going to end up dying in hell. Because we have in our minds all the stuff we know. We have in our minds all the stuff we did from the time we were a child. Until we, listen, 26 years old, I've been in church all my life. My grandfather was the pastor. My grandfather died. My uncle became the pastor. I sung in the choir. I was a missionary. I did Bible studies. I, I led the song service and all the wonderful stuff that you can do to know Jesus Christ. But when that yoke of iron was lifted, when I decided that this Jesus stuff wasn't enough, I was gone. I wasn't backslidden. I didn't have to recommit my life to God. I was lost. I was not saved. I could speak in tongues with the best of you. I could shout. I can shout better than all of y'all. I can do all those things that people thought made a good Christian. And when I walked away from church, people were shocked. <gasps> they were shocked. I was about 15. And for the next 10, 12 years, I was not saved. I had not lost my salvation. I'd never had it. I had not lost my salvation. I never had it. I had heard all the things that, that would make you a Christian. I rejected it. I didn't lose my salvation. I never had salvation. Because the Bible tells us in Hebrews, I think I'm going to get there at some point. The Bible tells us in Hebrews that if you walk away from it, you can't come back to it. Hebrews chapter 6. Let's go there real quick. Hebrews chapter 6. Let's go there really, really quick. I want us to see this because we're going to have to stop. Hebrews chapter 6. Let me see if I can find it really, really quick. 
Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 <clears throat> through 6. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. Maybe you read Hebrews chapter 6 and just read and ran across and didn't think about it. But, but let's be realistic. The word of God is the best commentary on the word of God. God is the one that calls you to salvation. You are the one that chooses. And once you are chosen, the Bible, Jesus says he will not lose any as we'll see in a minute. Verse number 4. For it is impossible... It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Once you've heard it and you are a partaker of it and you have accepted it, all right, verse 6, if they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance. Once, if you claim that you are a child of God, you can't fall away because seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So if, if you say you're a child of God and you went and backslid in the word that the, the way backslidden is, is understood in this day and age, the way it is that you're saved, but you're just living like the devil. But you're saved, but you're living like the devil, all right? That's back. That's what the today's version of backslidden. The biblical version of backslidden is that today you chose not to obey God. You're a child of God, but you chose not to obey him. He came to you, got you right, you got right. That's backsliding. We do that all the time. It is not a lifestyle. Backsliding is not a lifestyle. But the Bible tells us here that, hey, <laughs> if you say you're a child of God and you turn away from the things of God, you can't come back. There is no getting back. That's why my brothers and I and Pentecostalism have an issue because they say you can lose your salvation and get it back. The word of God says you can't. If you could lose it, you can never get it back because that means that Jesus would have to come down from heaven just for you, which he's already done, and get back up on that cross just for you, which he's already done. That's not going to happen because he said it is finished. He said it once for all. Think on this. When you're sitting around and the Holy Spirit is trying to talk to you and explain to you and draw you back to the Lord, are you saved? You're not backslidden when you just go live for the, the world. That's not backslidden. That's never saved. Never saved. Get it right with God. While we may not understand everything about election, because we don't, because it is God's preview. It's, it's God's path for us. And we don't always understand everything about predestination, because I don't, because I still say, wait a minute, God. I still have a hard time with it. You know, God has decided that these people will be saved. They will be saved. There is no, there is no maybe, maybe not. No one who God has, des has, has chosen to be saved has died and gone to hell. No one, because then that means God is lying. That means that God isn't strong enough to bring his will about. I have a hard time with that. I have a hard time with that because I don't know who God's choosing, right? I don't know. You don't know. But we do know that God has predestined folks to salvation and predestined folks not to salvation. Not because he's a, a mean God and doesn't love you, because he already knows what you're going to choose to do. And yet, in his predestination, and in, in, in his knowing that you are going to so somebody, somebody's going to reject him. He still sent his son to die on the cross. He still gives you an opportunity to hear the gospel. That's why I don't understand. That's why I'm not God, because if I was God and I knew the people that was going to be saved, I'd just keep the people that was going to be saved. Everybody else can go take a hike. And then how we, how we choose our friends, right? We choose our friends, the people that hang out with us. We love them. We enjoy them. Everybody, people that irritate us and get on our nerve, we don't hang out with. And that's how we think God is. But that isn't how God is. God has given the invitation to the whole world. And he has called those who will answer. Will you answer the call? There are some that in your mind you're thinking right now, They'll never answer the call. They'll never answer. I, I get a kick out of people to tell me they're atheists. <laughs> and I always say, so you believe that God, so you believe that God doesn't exist. Well, yeah, then you believe in God. You just told me you believe God doesn't exist. Or the ones that are agnostics. I, I don't believe in God, the supreme being, but I believe there's something out there. Okay, now you're just a silly, you're you're more silly 
than the atheist because at least the atheist is being honest. You just don't want to be, you don't want to be um, responsible to God, so you just call him a high power, you know. But do you know we can have Christians, Christian atheists? I believe God, but he doesn't have anything to do with my life. I'm just saved. If I can live whatever way I want, I'm just saved. Then we have Christian agnostics. Well, I know God is up there somewhere, and someday I'll have to deal with him, but not right now. But not right now. But there is a holy God who is calling us to salvation, who is calling us to holiness, who has elected us, who has predestined us from the foundations of the world. Jesus knows who we are because he already told us that God has given, to, given us to him. One more verse in um, John chapter 10. I really wanted to finish this. I wonder, can I get this done? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> in John chapter 10, now I got to find it. So I didn't write it down. It just popped in my head as I was talking. Uh, John chapter 10, I think 27. John 10, I think it's 27. Yes, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Are you following Jesus? Are you following Jesus? That word follow doesn't mean just to go behind. That means to be hard on, right there where he is. Are you following Jesus? And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. There goes losing your salvation right there. If you are strong enough to take your hand, take yourself out of Jesus' hand, then you're stronger than God. Because he says, my father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. Can you take yourself out of Jesus' hand? If you know that you are not living for God at this moment, if you know that your life is not pleasing to God at this moment, if you know that you have no desire to walk with God, to please God, don't lie to yourself and say, I'm backslidden. Don't lie to yourself. Don't let Satan lie to you and don't let yourself lie to you. You are either not saved and on your way to hell, Or you need to get saved. If your desire is nothing for God, it's just, you know what, as soon as I get a chance, I'm gone. You know what, I'm not listening to this anymore. I'm, I'm tired of this. Y'all, but Mrs. McMillan, even Peter, even Peter went back fishing. Everybody tells that story of Peter. I go a fishing. Yeah, and and what, did, what happened? Jesus was right there. When you decided that you no longer wanted the things of God, was the Holy Spirit right there drawing you back to himself? Because if he wasn't, it's a good chance you're not saved. If the Holy Spirit of God, not our moral conscience. Everybody has a moral conscience. We're all born with a moral conscience. That's why, that's why you grow up even as a little kid and don't do certain things, because we know right from wrong. The Bible tells us that. So that's part of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We know right from wrong. Not a moral conscience, but something stronger, something deeper that's calling you back to him. Not just telling you, be a good person. That's what our moral conscience tells us. Be a good person. But the Holy Spirit of God draws us further than be a good person. Are you being drawn further than just be a good person? Is the Holy Spirit of God driving you back to Jesus? Not to goodness, not to church, but to Jesus. He said, the Father giveth them to me. Have you been given to Jesus Christ? Is your life in Christ? Are you following hard after the Lord? Or are you just doing like I did when I was 15, just find, looking for an opportunity to go and do my own thing, looking for an opportunity to walk away from God? Because remember, backsliding doesn't mean a way of life. It isn't a way of life. You're either saved or you're lost. 
you either saved or you lost. A lot of people assume that the Jews, because they were Jews, all Jews went to heaven. That's a lie. God is not unrighteous. All Jews did not go to heaven. They had to choose, just like we have to choose. Korah had to choose to follow Moses. When he didn't, God opened up the earth and swallowed them in. We must choose to answer that call of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I don't understand, but I'm glad you do. I don't always get it, but Lord, I'm glad you always see it. I thank you for the call that you put upon my life. Lord, I thank you that you chose me to be a child of God. God, I thank you that you have chosen many to be a child of God. Help us all to be thankful that you called us to be a child of God. Lord, if we are not saved, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will draw us to you. Help us to choose. Our responsibility is to choose, is to say yes. Lord, help us not to waste your time. Help us not to waste our own time, but to get busy for you. I thank you, Lord, for what you have done. Be with us. Open our minds and our hearts, Lord, to this doctrine of election and predestination and human responsibility, Lord. Show us, remind us, give us your grace as we search these scriptures to see that we have eternal life, Lord. Help us to be faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty.